I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see my neighbor is Great. Okay, well, we're ready to go on to the next uh, talk, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Peter McWilliam. Now, Peter is a member of the Clower Historical Society, the Cregan Historical Society, and the Irish Genealogical Research Society. He's going to say a few words about his own background in his talk, so I won't uh, uh, spoil the surprise for you. Um, but uh, Peter is going to talk to us about uh, triangulated segments, and this is a really exciting topic in genetic genealogy, because it has the potential to bring us back much further in time than uh, we would possibly imagine. And uh, Peter himself has done uh, this particular study on uh, what uses a combination of, of records uh, from clones uh, and uh, American family records on the other side of the pond. So here to talk to us about a tale of triangulated segments, please give a warm welcome to Peter McWilliam. Okay, Morris. Can you work? Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. And thanks very much for the invitation, Morris, and thank you all for attending. Um, I just want to emphasize this is very much a collaborative project with Jeff. And when I'm talking about early records, I'm talking about the 1800 to 1830 period. Now, this is my main collaborator, Jeff Blakely. He's an archaeologist at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And he's about my age, so you can see that he's moved into the supervisory classes. Now, the, the backdrop here is obviously not Madison. In fact, it's Israel. And for the last number of years, he's been engaged in a summer dig in Israel. So on his way either there or back, he drops into either London or Ireland. So we've had a number of opportunities to discuss genealogy. Now, Jeff's or one line of Jeff's ancestors migrated from Clonus in 1849. And Jeff and another American collaborator, Norm Prince, have tracked a chain migration from Clonus to Mercer County, Illinois in the mid-19th century. Think sort of 1835 to 1875, and comprising something in the order of 50 families, including a branch of my family that I wasn't aware of. Myself, I was a professional geneticist. I escaped into genealogy a number of years ago, but unfortunately the onset of DNA testing has sort of dragged me back in. And if Morris isn't listening, I have a small confession that my main interest is really in local history and in early records, you know, around 1800 and before, and what DNA testing can add to those records and genealogy. Um, I grew up in Monaghan, and now live in Dublin. My ancestry, back to 1800, and for many lines back as far as 1700 and before, is South Ulster. So if you think Banbridge, Newry, South Armagh, in Tyrone, Dungannon, Ochnacloy, Fintana, and then Monaghan Town, and of course Clones. And over half of my second great-grandparents are Presbyterian, but you can see that um, I have, I'll talk later in, about a couple of landed gentry lines that I have. Now, because of this sort of Presbyterian background, I've always been interested in this 18th century Ulster Scots migration, particularly sparked by the fact that a fourth great-grandfather was a ship's captain from Newry, uh, and he was involved in the migrant trade from Newry to Philadelphia and New York <clears throat> in the period 1760 to 1775. Um, and this, oh, it's the wrong one. I mean, this is a picture of Carlingford Lock with the Newry Ship Canal in the background and Warren Point where migrants uh, embarked. And I was, because my ancestry is all in South Ulster, I was slightly surprised 
I shouldn't have been, but I was slightly surprised with my first family tree test when I realized how many American cousins I have. Now, I have a lot in the 19th century, but there are a significant number um, who are tracking into southern U.S., which presumably must be part of this 18th century Ulster Scots migration. Just a little housekeeping. This talk is based in part on a paper that Jeff and I wrote for the Irish Genealogist, which is the journal of the Irish Genealogical Research Society. Now, this is a family-based study with it's some advantages and some limitations. Now, earlier today we heard a super talk by Mark McDowell on local history. But there are other local DNA projects in Clonus Cahill Michael Gunn, who's going to be talking tomorrow, has set up the Fermanagh Moore Monaghan Border project on Family Tree, and Sean Corr has a Ross Lay project with about ten participants. So it's going to be interesting to see how these different approaches or what information we get from these different approaches. Now, I just want to distinguish between close and distant cousins. Now, it's a slightly arbitrary distinction, but if, we, if I look in my sort of ancestry <coughs> test, for example, and I first and second and sometimes even third cousins, it can, it's often possible to estimate the relationship directly from the shared DNA, because we share a lot of DNA with those. And of course, in this period, we've got really good um, online Irish records. And the situation when we get into the 1800-1830 period is trickier. We share a lot less DNA with fourth and more distant cousins. Uh, the spread is correspondingly greater. So we really can't estimate the relationship directly um, from the amount of shared DNA. And there are a number of techniques to get around that. And today I'm going to talk about triangulation to address some genealogical puzzles. The records that I'm going to talk about in Clonus, I'm going to be, it's Protestant families. I'm going to talk about the Church of Ireland records are good with some 18th century coverage. Presbyterians, we have some brick walls before 1820. So we have to use alternative records. And today I'm going to talk about land records. Think tie the plotman books, estate records, records in the registry of deeds. Now, if you think what we get out of the church record, we get connections, spousal pairs, parents, children. And what we're hoping is that we can use DNA to link land records. I mean, these are going to be lists of names by townland. Can we link those? And of course, there are a whole ream of other alternative records, both in Clonus and any other parish you care to mention. But I'm going to just use land records as an example here. OK, just a little more detail on the Clonus records. We have baptisms and marriages back to 1793, and then a combined register with vestry minutes and a scattering of baptismal records back to the 1780s. Now, one point I want to make about these is that these records through familysearch.org have been online for a very long time. So they have been available for everyone. So if I go into my ancestry tree and just go search born clonus, I'm going to pull up a whole pile of people. I have access to a number of other family trees, so I can really build a database of people who are claiming clonus ancestry. Now, I'm not saying any individual one will have any genealogical significance, but it certainly has a really good, uh, it's a really good database. I've mentioned the Stonebridge Presbyterian Church in Clonus, the marriage records start, marriage baptism both start in 1820. Now, the estate that I'm going to talk about is the Barrett Leonard estate, which has a, oops, wrong one, which has a whole series of rent rolls, in fact, all the way back to 1633. Um, and because work, oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have also, I and others have abstracted something in the order of 300 deeds from the general clonus area and those can all be accessed at the registry of deeds indexing project now because we're kind of interested in having records as widely available as possible 
Norm Prince has transcribed the Church of Ireland baptisms and marriages, and they can be found at the Irish Genealogical Project Archive, obviously for free. Um, I have a lot of the Barrett Leonard estate records have been published in the Claha record, but probably the most detailed one is the 1746 7 one, and I have uploaded that to my own family website at this link. I've also put up some records for a smaller estate in the region, the Foster Estate. Um, sorry. This one. Okay. Am I? That's fine. Uh, just to look a little closer at what we might expect to get in the estate records, and this is a sort of an extract from a much larger table I created. And I have here a series of a subset of largely of rural town lands, and the number of lease oops, the number of leaseholders in 1791, 1817, and then for the Tyler the books. And what we can see is that um, the number of leases in this period. It's identical, pretty much identical between 1817 and the Tithe Plotman books. But there's a really sharp fall off between 1791, by 1791, and then back as we go back further. And what seems to have happened is that sometime around after 1800, the linen industry in the parish was really booming. And as head leases fell due, the landlord opted to lease directly to the occupiers. So what you're getting here is all of the leases. Here you're only getting the head tenants. And you can see just from the numbers I've got here of entries for the Registry of Deeds that these are largely going to cover head tenants. And in fact of the 300 odd deeds I've looked at only a handful will mention occupiers by name. Um, and just one further point that um, I apologize. Um, Tie the Plotment books also on, uh, only record lease, leaseholders so that cottiers and laborers without leases will not be present in, in those records. Okay, if we get on to Clona, the parish and the families, Clonus is quite a large parish. 250 townlands. I like the relief because you can see that um, all the townlands are <laughs> d defined by drumlands. The parish is half in County Monaghan and half in Fermanagh, and this is the county line. The main Church of Ireland is in the Diamond in Clonus, but sometime early in the 19th century there were two chapels of ease, one in Ahadrum Sea one not shown here in Clough near Rosley. So in if you're looking at the records later on, you're going to they're going to be described as the town division, the western division, the eastern division. Stonebridge Presbyterian Church is here, and the Barrett Leonard estate has a lot of townlands around Clonus, but it stretches out all the way to this little pink dot which is Smithborough. Um, okay. Moving on to the families, and I'm talking about Eccles, Blakely, and my grandmother's family, the Henrys. The first mention of, Gilbert, of the Eccles family is Gilbert Eccles, who appears in the census of 1659 as the titulado of the manor of Shannock, and this is Shannock, and the estate is in this region here. Um, in 1671, he purchased the manor of Fintana in County Tyrone, and that became the main family seat. Um, his grandson used the manor of Shannock to provide portions for his younger children. Now the estate actually remained in the family till, 19, till it was sold through the Land Commission in 1907. The Land Commission deeds are in Prony, and they're an absolute treasure trove of wills and deeds and so on. Now, what is of interest to us is one of Daniel's younger children, a daughter, Isabella, who married the Reverend Francis Lucas in the 1650s. He was a curate in the parish, um, a member of the Lucas family of Castle Shane near Monaghan. And they lived in the townland of Clonkeen. 
1667, the Barrett Leonard Estate Archive records a, a lease of Matthew Blakely, the townland of what was then Cloncurk Hill, now Cloncurk. And for the next hundred years, he and his descendants occupied either Cloncurk or the neighboring townland of Legna Kelly. Now by 1800, there seemed to have been two Blakely families in, in the parish, one Presbyterian, one Church of Ireland, and I honestly don't know whether they were related. So the Presbyterian family were occupying townlands in this region, the Church of Ireland one occupying townlands in this region, and Geoffrey is descended from this group. <coughs> Finally, <coughs> um, Around 1800, there were a lot of Henrys in the, in the parish, almost all of them Presbyterian. Well, I presume they came in sometime after 1703, but the first reference I have to them is in a marriage settlement of 1783, and I'll talk about them in the last portion of the talk. Okay, just to summarize that, we have the Reverend Francis Lucas and marrying Isabella Eccles, both born in the 1720s, and they're my fifth great-grandparents. And we have Matthew Blakely and his wife, Alice Lucas, who both died in the 1840s, and they were Jeff's second great-grandparents. And in 1849, their children, including Jeff's great-grandfather, Edward, emigrated with Alice's sister, Isabella, her husband, Johnson Lipton, and daughter, Alice, and they went from, through Liverpool to New Orleans, up the Mississippi, to Mercer County, Illinois, where they appear in the 1850 census. And the question we're asking is, what, if any, is the relationship between this Alice Lucas and this Lucas family? And the DNA tests that we have in the project, I've tests, I paid for tests for some close relatives, so I have um, four who are matching both the Eccles Lucas and the Henry lines. The Eccles Lucas have much deeper genealogy, so I was able to identify eight individuals to take tests from this line, and then only four and restricted to four third cousins for these Henrys. So I only have four of those. Jeff has identified eight people to take tests, descendants of either his second great-grandmother, Alice, or her sister, Isabella. And in addition, I mean, just to emphasize this is an ongoing project, additionally more distant Blakeleys identified by rebuilding trees from family search and ancestry. On a continuing basis, some of these have also contributed DNA, and in fact I talk about those in the paper I mentioned earlier. Okay, why do we think there's a relationship between Francis Isabella Lucas and Alice? And if we look at the, if we look at the children of Francis and Isabella, and this is from a Will in the Land Commission papers, and we have a list of the names of their children, and we have a list of the names of the children of Matthew and Alice from the Clonus Baptismal reg Registers, and we can see that all of the names here, all of them, are represented here. So at the very least, this is a claim of relationship. Whether it's Ill legitimate or illegitimate, we don't know. But Jeff, on his first visit to Clonus in 1973, looked, looked at the Clonus baptismal registers and he identified Alice, Alicia, illegitimate daughter of Charles Lucas, the townland of Cromahe. Now that's a townland in the Shannock estate and the presumption is that Charles Lucas here is the youngest son of Francis and Isabella. So he just assumed that was his ancestor. Until a few years ago, on another visit to Prony, where he came across the will of Charles Robert Lucas, who died in 1845. And this is, in fact, what sparked his contact with me. Um, and the major, Charles Robert, married late in life in 1811. He had no children. Major beneficiary in his will was Thomas, son of his brother Frank. And then there are, at the end of the will, there are these four bequests to Fanny Clarkson, Mary Ann West, Alice Gordon, and Charlotte Lucas, who went to America 
So we revisit the Clonus baptismal re registers, and we identify Marianne, Alicia, <coughs> and Charlotte, and we can presume these all, all of these three are children, illegitimate children, of Charles Lucas and Mary Maguire. So Jeff, uh, Jeff did a lot of the legwork in the genealogy searching, um, identified direct descendants of Mary Ann West and Alice Gordon. Both took DNA tests, both downloaded to GEDmatch, and we then compared their DNA tests to all of the others in our database. And we come up with this, and this is my first sort of example of triangulation, so I want to go through it just in a little bit of detail. We have a descendant of Francis Ann Lucas matching a descendant of Alice Gordon on chromosome 15 at a particular location. She also matches the descendant of Mary Ann West in the same place. Now, just remember, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, um, one paternal, one maternal. So if we just think of the first two lines, it's conceivable that this is on, say, the paternal chromosome and this is on the maternal chromosome. We need to show that these two actually indeed match each other to complete the triangulation, which is the case. This proves that these three have a common ancestor. Who is it? And as, as it happens, I'm the descendant of Francis Ann Lucas. The descendant of Alice Gordon has significant Ulster ancestry, including some ancestry in Armagh, which I also have. So it is conceivable that as well as this hypothetical Francis Lucas Isabella Eccles match, we could have a match somewhere in the distant past in our Armagh ancestry. However, the descendant of Mary Ann West only has one Irish ancestral line. The overwhelming bulk of her ancestry is in fact Scandinavian. So it seems safe to conclude that the common ancestors are in fact Isabella and Frank. Which leaves the question, if Alice Lucas, wife of Matthew Blakeman, is not the daughter of Charles Robert Lucas, who is she? Is she a member of this family at all? So we did, in, as part of our sort of search of all of our uh, database, we identified a further triangulated match, this time between a descendant of Isabella Lucas, a descendant of Alice Lucas, and a different descendant of Francis Ann Lucas. And we have a triangulated match. And just as a technical note, this descendant of Alice Lucas is actually not on Jet Match, so we have to look at the tests of the other two on, on their respective family tree tests to confirm the triangulation. And they must have a common ancestral couple, which is likely Francis Lucas and Isabella Eccles. So can we fit Isabella and Alice into what we know about the Lucas family tree. And sometime around 18, before 1835, my second great aunt, Anna Maria Dixon, constructed a family pedigree. Now, she was a minor beneficiary in the will of Charles Robert Lucas. She was born in 1813. So she would have known the living members of, the, of this group. So the it seems a reasonably reliable source. She identified three children of Isabella and Frank, who themselves had children. These two here are well known within the family. We know the genealogies really well. Some of them have, in fact, contributed DNA to the project. We know rather less about Frank, who died married with two married daughters and one son. The son married in 1835, and Jeff and I were able to track his descendants, but unfortunately they seem to have died out in the 1950s, which is unfortunate, because DNA from them would have been really nice. But the question is, could they have been Isabella Lucas Lipton or Alice Lucas Blakely? And it is consistent with the evidence. That's really all we can say by its very nature. DNA is never 
going to give us a conclusive answer. All we can say is that we can we we'll just sit on the result, we're waiting, will more documentation come in, will more matches come in, which might further support or refute the contention. But we are never going to get an absolute answer with DNA. It's just one additional piece of proof that we can add. Okay, so that was Church of Ireland in the uh, parish. I want to switch now to the Henry family and Presbyterians influence. I just put up a photograph of the meeting house and I couldn't resist the stone bridge over the River Finn. And just to note the River Finn going along here. And um, it, in this area here, it actually separates out the parishes of Clonus and Kilevan. Now, the main record that we have for this uh, used here is an 1835 census of the Stonebridge Presbyterian Church generated by the minister, the Reverend William White. And he details 180 families by townland giving parents and children. And the numbers here are the numbers in, the, in each townland. So you've got two in the townland of Drumgilly. You've got two in the townland of Anna McKiff, who happen both to be Henry's. The major concentration is here in the townland of Grantshamore, the townland of the meeting house, where we have 13 families and 14 in nearby Creve Lee. And then they spread out and into the Fermanagh portion. Note that there are real, the major urban centre is Clonus, and there are very few Presbyterian families here. So we're inferring these are farming families, and there are also very few in sort of the Shannock estate here. What we're seeing is a clustering of these. Uh, the estates I mentioned in Brown, the Barrett Leonard estate with townlands around Clonus and out towards Smithborough. The Foster estate has townlands in the parish of Kilevan and one in Clonus. And it has a rent roll that actually, or a rent book from 1803 to 1820, which is really nice. And you can see that both of these estates are really useful for Presbyterian genealogy and records. Okay, now in 1819, the Synod of Ulster sent out a directive to ministers uh, suggesting they keep marriage baptism records. And so a lot of the Presbyterian records actually start just exactly in this period, which is a problem for me because I have sort of six, eight second great grandparents who were born in the decade and a half before that. So I have a string of Presbyterian brick walls. I'm going to use one of these as an example here today. Dr. Richard Henry he died in Clonus in 1898, aged 80. Was he born in Clonus? Now, if we think about Richard Henry's parents, we've got a Henry father and then a mother of unknown maiden name. We've got a grandfather with three unknown maiden names. Great grandfather, seven unknown names. Add in sisters who will marry out. And as a consequence, what we're looking for are fourth, fifth, sixth cousins who appear in the records post-1820 and ma many, the majority, will have unknown names. How do we go about tracking that? How do we identify these cousins? Well, we can triangulate with known third cousins and I have a number of Henry second and third, third cousins and look for those who have Clonus ancestry. We can try and triangulate directly to place common segments of people who have Clonus ancestry. Now, inevitably, in this, we're going to have to try and build match trees, identify matches, build them back, and see can we get them into Clonus. I mean, obviously, segment triangulation is the gold standard, but that's not always possible. So sometimes we're going to have to combine segment triangulation with pedigree triangulation for ancestry matches. And what we're trying to do is create a database of names, and we're looking for recurring names and places. Essentially, this is what I think genealogists do in adoption studies. I'm just trying to do it 
quite a lot earlier with rather less by way of records. Okay, just using the sort of preview, the, the, the criteria I mentioned, I put a whole series, anything that looked as though it could be connected to the Henry family onto Johnny Pearl's DNA painter site. And I'm ju I've just extracted a sort of a subset of examples here. And this is a group based on descendants of Richard Henry and Anne Jane Donaldson. I just want to point out that I've taken this match from Family Tree, this match from 23andMe, this group is not a, a triangulated group. There are triangulations within it. For example, RM is also a Henry III cousin triangulating with SW. And first, SW and RE have clonus ancestry. And when I say involving townlands in the Barrett Leonard estate, they also appear in the church records in the Tide the Plotman books, references in the Registry of Deeds. There's a whole series of useful records with respect to them. BG is Canadian, and I was able to pull her ancestry back into a marriage in 1836 in Stonebridge Presbyterian Church. A baptism of Catherine Andrews, I think, in 1818 in the Church of Ireland, which was the townland of Maharani. I can find her with her parents in the 1835 uh, Stonebridge census, and I can also track them back a generation to, an 1803, to 1803 in the townland of Maharani in the Foster estate. Now, this recurring names. So S, I should actually share two fragments with SW. And the second one, we have William Brown, son of Walter Brown and Jane Martin of Caravitra. This match is a triangulation between AR, SW, AR. Her parents are Dawson Delamere and a Jane Martin. Now, these two Jane Martins are roughly contemporaneous. If we look at the children, we can make a direct, we have here some entries from, for the town land of Trumbilly in the 1835 Stonebridge census. And we can see a direct correspondence, Anne Elizabeth, Anne Eliza, John Henry, well, we are interested in Henry's, we have Alice, Alice, we have Sarah Matilda, we have Matilda, Sarah, Joseph, Martin. So we can presume it's likely that Jane fits into, into this family group. This Jane Martin has a grandson who was Joseph Martin Moorhead, I think. Um, and it's possible that she, she fits into this. And it's possible that these two, that their ancestor could be a common ancestor of SWAR. In other words, we are in a position to create a hypothesis that we can test further. I'm not stating that as fact, it's just something that we can, we can. Now, here, I have also have a second shared fragment with AR. Here, these three are all on ancestry, all, and all share a match. M, H, and K share a Spear Armstrong marriage in the 1750s. Now, if you rem remember AR, her has an ancestor, Dawson Delamere, and we can see Spear and Delamere in the townland of Drumgarley in the tithe books. So in principle, what we're asking is, can we, is, can we make a connection through DNA to a lit someone in the tithe books? Now, this as a standalone has no you know, significance. It's just part of looking for more matches, looking for more documentation. It's just a possibility. And a sl an even more nebulous one in a, way, in a way. YM in her uh, has, um, I've, in her family, tr family tree, tracks back to an, 
the marriage or the a, a young couple in uh, sorry um, a, 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 a young a, a young couple in the um, 1901 census and I was able to track the wife back through the civil records to, to this marriage here Anne Jane Henry of Anna McKiff so that is in itself an inter interesting triangulating with JN who has no stated Irish ancestry but does have the back in the mid 18th century a Whitaker Wiggins <coughs> marriage and those two are pretty common names in Clonus. It's nebulous but the question is can we then pu pull him back into Clonus and can we add names into a list that might connect up with other names that would appear as more people test and match. It's just we are short of records and we are trying to get the value from every record source that we have. Now I just want to ask just how far back <coughs> can we triangulate? And the this is Greystone behind Second Bally Bay Presbyterian Church. The top two names are the Reverend James Morell, who was born near Limavady, and Letitia Harris of Clonus. And in fact, her mother was Frances Anne Lucas. And what I have here is a triangulated match with my first cousin and two fourth cousins, who themselves are third co or second cousins triangulated match on chromosome 11 and this is part of a much larger triangulation group uh, so it's actually a five-way triangulation and the two additional members DA and KB um, who themselves are fourth cousins have a common ancestor Thomas Miller who was born 1773 in Abbeville South Carolina now if we trace genealogy back from him we come to a Margaret Patton and the latter was born in 1655 in the townland of Ruski in Gomoko's <coughs> parish which is near Limavady. Um, we have deeds that link John Morell, father of the Reverend James Morell, back to Samuel Morell who leased a quarter of Ballyquin townland in Baltea parish in 1700. Now Limavady is actually in Dromoko's Altea is the parish immediately south of that, so we're talking of a, a few miles. Now, we haven't got enough data. We're not close to identifying a common ancestor. Um, at best, we're triangulating to place. But there's a serious sort of caveat here. And that is that if we follow Thomas Miller one line, we go back to Margaret Patton. If we follow him on a different line over two generations, we come to an ancestor who was born in Ireland. Where in Ireland? Now, in the worst case scenario, it's Clonus, and the focus of the triangulation goes from Limavady to Clonus. And the a tip, a rule of thumb I picked up from Jim Bartlett's segmentology blog was that if you're going from a secure triangulation back, for each generation you go back, you need at least one additional match. And what I'm really trying to emphasize is just how difficult it is. I mean, I think this, I'm not sure whether we can resolve this, whether we can resolve it to place, whether we could ever identify common ancestors. It's just a numerical look at how difficult it is to get back this far. Okay, um, some just as in conclusion. I mean, we are lucky in this project. I mean, we have a landed gentry family with ancestry, very good ancestry, all the way back to the 1650s. Um, the Blakely families are present in land re in church records, land records. They seem to have been head tenants. So that gives us in the future the possibility of checking just how far back we can push DNA testing 
with a controlled known answer, if you like. Um, again, just to reiterate the combination of documentary evidence and triangulation through DNA testing has allowed us to connect up these Blakely and Lucas families. Triangulation with cousins and with cousins in place identifies cousins behind the Henry brick wall who can be linked to church and land records. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to resolve my own Henry problem, but in a number of cases that I've sort of talked about, the possibility is that we can push other families back into the 18th century. We've tracked a 19th century migration in our particular group of farmers across into North America, Canada. Um, and it's possible at that level to integrate the records quite well, and, you know, add value to genealogies there. But of course, 18th century migration is still challenging. We need a lot more matches as we go further back. And my point about triangulation back to 1700, will we ever get enough matches? I don't know. Now, I've worked all of my, sort of examined all my family trees and so on by eye. It's tedious. So I'm hoping, and I haven't really sort of explored it, G-Works is one of a suite of programs developed by Rob Worthen um, for adoption studies. I mean, he talked in Dublin in October and also, I think, in 2014. And in essence, or a, as a simplification, if it's um, extracting data from, so we'll say, ancestry test matches and trees and creating searchable databases. And I'm hoping that might make tree searching a little easier. And my thanks to everyone who's contributed DNA, shared genealogy, and so on. The project wouldn't have been possible without them. And in the process of inevitably, I've made a very large number of friends worldwide, and of course, particularly to Jeff. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's a fascinating insight into the difficulty of trying to use DNA to get back into the 1700s. Um, where do, you said you need more matches, and I think obviously with this type of uh, analysis, the more matches you can get, the, the more your ability to attempt triangulation. Yeah. Um, where are you getting your matches from? Are you getting them from all of the uh, DNA testing databases? <sighs> A lot of them are on Ancestry and have downloaded to GEDmatch. Now, what inevitably one of the frustrating things is that I've got l loads of matches to my Henry line on Ancestry. and I've got loads of people who won't reply to emails. I even have people who have taken portions of my family tree for their, put it onto their own. I still won't reply to emails. So... Uh, uh, but no, all, all sources, I mean, 23andMe, fam, fam, Family Tree, they come in all shapes and sizes. And I mean, I think this sort of pedigree triangulation type thing, you know, where you're trying to do it without genealogy, uh, without, sorry, without segment data, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. Um, well, it would be great if there was a tool developed by some clever person out there that would make <laughs> people reply to you. Uh, <laughs> make them do their family tree. Um, you must do an awful lot of tree building yourself. Um, no, a bit. A, a, a bit. Um, do you not find matches who say, oh, I've got, I think I have relatives from clones, but I haven't done clones. my family tree. Clonus, Clonus. Clonus. you're in Ireland, it's Clonus. Clonus, <laughs> Clonus. <laughs> beyond uh, my grandparents, so you have to do... Oh, know. yes, uh, yeah. There, there's a lot. There's a lot of, 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 of linking, linking up of that of that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. And how many people in the audience have actually got ancestry from clones? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
there's a whole, there's a whole row of them there. Right, okay. You have to swap them before they leave. Um, <laughs> Carl's probably already got them. All right. So, uh, questions, for, questions for Peter? Yeah, we have a question here from Debbie. I'm just wondering if you consider using Y-chromosome DNA testing, which is much more effective for more reaching back in the <clears throat> Um, with the big Y, you can actually get the complete branching process. Um, or are there not enough descendants of all those? Well, see, I mean, I don't. My Y isn't clonus. Jeff okay. tried Y, and he, his was one of those that we got nothing with. Mm. I'm trying, but I don't actually have a Henry Y. Um, so, and because we're starting, you know, with a family and work, working out. I mean, I think Cahill with the, you know his border project, I think there are a lot of Ys that have, people have taken Y in that. So it's probably going to build, but directly at this stage we ha I mean, we thought about it, it hasn't fallen into our hands, but we are always looking for that, you know, for that approach. But yes, I mean, incorporating Y, of course, but it, I mean, it just seems that you get very individual results with Y. I mean, if we're looking at a few hundred Presbyterian families over the, the 18th century, are we going to get Ys for all of them? Whereas, I, I mean, I would say the autosomal test has connected in, you know, 30, 40 families, you know, so... But we're only at 1800. We are picking up a lot of the, getting a good representation. And Carl, how do you think your project is going to uh, synergy with um, what Peter's doing? Well, I think it has tremendous capacity in the future. It's a very small project at present, and probably could do with a lot more people testing and joining it. Um, I have a number of cases in my own relatives that uh, have done Y37. And the closest match is themselves. So that's the challenge. We just need more people to test. Mm. Fine. Any other questions for Peter? Any any questions about the records in Clonus? Yeah. Yeah, Michael. Peter, you mentioned about the heads of the estate and changing the who was registered on, on the estate. Due to the linen business or something, I didn't get what you were getting at. Yeah, I mean, the linen industry was probably booming around around the 1800 period. Um, I mean, it only started to sort of collapse, you know, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So it was clear to the landlord that the under tenants were going to be in a position to pay leases and he could get more money by leasing directly to them rather than allowing the head tenant or middlemen to take a cut. So, uh, just referring, say, to the likes of Griffith's valuation then, he was skipping out the, would be, if, if it was on Griff, Griffith's valuation, it would be the actual overlap owner of the big estate. Well, Griffith's valuation only, the, the lessor is just the immediate lessor. So there could well, that person could well have been leasing from a, an over a landlord. I mean, there's a vertical structure all the way. Yes. So. Okay. No, but I mean, some of the some of the uh, registered tenants in the Griffiths would be just a couple of acres, and they're, yes. they're over. They'd be renting from somebody maybe with two hundred acres. So are you saying the person above those then? Was directly leasing to the... Well, I mean, I, I'm, ta I'm talking 60 years before Griffith valuation. Okay. So that process would already have happened. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Fine. Any other questions for Peter? Great. Okay. Well, uh, we'll call it a day there. But um, thanks once again, Peter, for giving us a fascinating insight into your project. Hopefully you'll come back and give us an update at some stage, especially if you find something really, really interesting. So uh, please give your thanks to Peter McQueen.
Yeah.